Back in 1993, I was approached by the United Nations to come to San Francisco. They wanted to come and uh, have a big service at Grace Cathedral. Uh, the United Nations Charter was written in San Francisco. It was signed in San Francisco, and after 50 years, they wanted to come back to San Francisco. And they said, would you uh, host us? And I said, yes. And they said, We're, we'd like to have a service where all the nations of the world are gathered and all the religions of the world are gathered. And we'd like to, um, and we'd like you to bring all the religions and we'll bring all the nations. And so I said, I'm not doing anything this afternoon. I'll just go out and get the religions. Uh, but I had two years to work on that. <clears throat> but I went to bed that night. And as I was lying there, I thought uh, nations, religions, nations, religions, the nations of the world have met every day together to struggle for global good for 50 years, every day. Now, the religions of the world in the same 50 years have not spoken to each other. And then I asked myself in bed that night in 1993, who is more moral in terms of having a, a, a vocation, a common vocation for the good of the world, the nations or religions? I was thinking about Hans Kuhn, who said, there'll never be peace among nations without peace among religions. And there'll never be peace among religions until, in my words, you, you have a level playing field where you can meet every day to carry on the kind of negotiations that would bring peace uh, among religions. And that would help bring peace among nations, and it would change the world. So I got in an airplane and I, I traveled all over the world and I spoke with the Pope and the Dalai Lama and the Mother Teresa and the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Sheikh of Alazar and the Grand Muftis. I went to Japan, Korea. I talked to every religious leader and said, um, are you all ready to deputize somebody from your tradition to meet with deputies from other traditions to uh, pursue peace among religions? And they said, no, we're not. So I said to myself, that's, that's uh, uh, very important because now I know where to go. Uh, we're going to go with the grassroots people. We're not going to go with the people at the top of religion. We're going to go to the people at the bottom of religion because um, they're unencumbered by the uh, administrative responsibilities and the theological responsibilities for purity uh, that are at the top of religions. So. Uh, I gathered 55 people together in San Francisco in 1996 and we linked arms and said we're going to go for the creation of this level playing field. We didn't know what it was going to look like, we didn't know what it was going to be named, we didn't know how it was going to be function, functioning, we didn't know what it was going to do, but we knew it had to happen. And we only had three ideas. Number one, it has to be grassroots. Number two, it has to be women and men. When I went around the world and I talked with religious leaders, I talked with men. And there'll never be peace among religions unless they're women and men together. And finally, we said, well, why should it just be people of religions? Why shouldn't it be indigenous people? Because their spirituality is older than a lot of religions. And why shouldn't it be people who say, I'm spiritual but not religious? I met people who said, I'm into spirituality and healing, spirituality and environment. Um, and we said, okay, if we're going to open the door, let's just open it all the way. And people of religions, people of indigenous traditions, people of spiritual expressions can, uh, are welcome to come. So I went out and I got a million dollar line of credit on my name only because I didn't have any money or assets. And uh, I uh, hired four people. One of them was Charles Gibbs, by the way. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, we started doing international interfaith uh, conferences around the world and we gathered people to work on the charter and to see what we're talking about and after a couple of years it dawned on us that people of religion know a lot about competition but they don't know a lot about cooperation so we said we got to get somebody who's not religious to come in here who knows how to create a global uh, organism and help us figure out how to do that with religions and indigenous traditions, etc. So I hired the guy who invented the visa card. Uh, his name is D. Hawk. And we said, D, <clears throat> how do you create a, not an organization, but an organism that'll grow itself? Where the greatest amount of authority is not in the top, but is in uh, the smallest unit. 
that's uh, unbureaucratic and decentralized. How do you do that? And he said, um, we can do it, but you have to sit in a room with me for three years. <laughs> I said, I'm a working man. I can't do that. Uh, and he said, uh, it's the only way you're going to do it. So 14 of us sat at a table for three years. Uh, every six weeks, we took three days off. And... Um, we tested and tested and tested every word. It took us three years to write one sentence. Uh, and that one sentence, the last hour, we had seven one sentences on the table. Uh, it is so hard to come to an agreement among all the religions of the world and indigenous traditions and spiritual expressions. Uh, and finally, in the year 2000, we finished the charter. Uh, and uh, we signed it in Pittsburgh in the year 2000. <clears throat> the genius about the United Religions Initiative is that it calls for the creation of uh, small cooperation circles, uh, self-organizing units of at least seven people who self-govern, they self-fund, they have their own agenda, they can do anything they want as long as it's in conformity with the purpose and principles of the United Religions Initiative. By the way, the first principle of the URI is the URI is not a, is not a religion. It is a bridge-building organization. Uh, if you think about it, the United Nations is not a nation. The United Religions is not a religion. What we're trying to do is help the religions from killing each other. Um, and therefore, we have to have people in here who are conversant and respectful of religions but not necessarily the leaders of religions. Uh, so that's why we also, we thought that uh, the concept of United Nations has a, it, it has some heavy baggage, but it also has a sense of uh, taking in the whole world. So we thought, okay, let's stick with United Religions, like United Nations, United Religions, but let's put the word initiative, because we're not everything, we don't have the cooperation and participation of all the religions of the world, but we're an initiative for, a, for the creation of a united religions. Someday uh, we'll disappear, and uh, someday we will be uh, followed by a united religions. So that's what we're working for. Uh, it'll take us a while, but we're getting there. Uh, the world uh, on the ground is becoming more interfaith oriented. If you look at uh, King Abdul of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, just had a conference, uh, and he brought uh, Roman Catholic, I mean, he brought Christians, Jews, and Muslims together. Now, this is the king of Saudi Arabia with Wahhabism, and uh, uh, probably the most intolerant country in the world. Uh, and they, <laughs> the king gets it. Uh, it's an interfaith world we're living in. Uh, we've got to we've got to change the way we do business uh, among faiths. So uh, Tony Blair is uh, he's starting his own foundation to do the same kind of thing we're doing. Uh, all kinds of people are getting it. Uh, we're not in competition. There's six billion people in the world. You can have all the united religions you want, and you don't have to compete with each other. Uh, but it's we're part of a movement. And the movement is away from uh, exclusively tribal, superior feeling religions to, uh, to a more, uh, a greater understanding for the common good. It's not, a, a religions can no longer just care about themselves. They've got to care about the rest of the world and the rest of people and the people of other religions as well. Uh, so we're all, we all have to elevate our game and we all have to live in a new reality. So the United Religions Initiative isn't everything, uh, but it's something, and it's, it's pretty good, and it's uh, powerful, and it's making an impact all over the world. Uh, we, we started in the year 2000, and in 2008, we're in 70 countries of the world. Uh, we've got 400 and some cooperation circles, and um, we've got about a million and a half people. So. Uh, there's a hunger out there. We, we wouldn't be growing like that unless the world uh, has a, is asking itself a new question. 
Uh, and the question is, how can we learn to live together? We can no longer live in a Muslim tribe, in a, in a Christian tribe, in a Jewish tribe, because we're all mixed up. If a Jewish man marries a Christian woman and they go into an apartment and lock the door, that's the United Religions Initiative. Uh, they just got to learn to live together. Um, and everybody else has got to learn to live together also. So that's what we're about.